Hello. Hello. How's everybody doing? Yeah. I am experiencing a little bit of issues today with connectivity. Oh, let's see, I feel like this one. Um, so I hope that doesn't continue. Uh, I seem to, my Zoom seem to start and restart and start and restart. Uh, am I the only one or? I hope this doesn't um, continue. So again, good news is that my morning class is, um, a lot of people had issues not hearing me, but not everybody. And then my Zoom went in and out a couple of times. So I'm just hoping that this doesn't uh, continue. But if it does either way, it seems that the recording on my end seems to be fine. So recording will be available. Okay. I also posted at an email about it. Javier, you asked me for videos. Um, and I posted those. I just didn't email you back. Did you find them all? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry, um, sorry about not emailing back, but <laughs> so part of it is I'm not sure actually if your settings are set to alert you when I upload something to the channel or not. Yes, they are. Uh, okay, then so did you get the emails then about that as well? Yes. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, and then Faizan, you had questions about uh, um, exercise. Yeah, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry about not in emailing back yesterday, kind of exploded. Um, so uh, the, there was one issue was the uh, comparison. That's because I actually removed simple thresholding from the <laughs> light up. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's hanging out there. I need to go modify the slides. But I also didn't actually officially post them as an assignment. Uh, yeah. I want to actually add to it today. Um, okay. Uh, so and that's part of the today's lecture so uh, apologies for not responding and the second one I didn't look into so I actually have to open up and see what the problem there was it seems to me from just looking at it um, that image of just should not be trash holding necessarily it, it you can just adjust the light to the to the image minimum and maximum uh, the problem is once you basically select a color lookup table for like the physics you mentioned, mm -hmm. it does not provide us any option of, about changing those colors because it's sort of a fixed template for it. Right. And one and, can actually really change, choose anything. So that's the least of the problem. Frankly, oh, just okay. choose something to visualize. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. Good enough. This was a, an example choice and I'm not certain right now why that choice doesn't work. Okay. So this was uh, for the uninitiated Faisan and I are discussing what was in those slides that I said that would be in the assignment. And there <laughs> seems to be uh, uh, two issues in there. One is that I was changing the slides to remove some of the options and then the text didn't change, get changed uh, accordingly. And one is on the visualization, there's a confusion. I'm thinking just visualize to see, to be able to see the, the result. That's it. So, okay. All right. Other than that, is everybody doing well this Wednesday? It's a little rainy. I'm going to take that as a yes. This is the weird part about the virtual uh, classroom is that I have no idea. I'm just talking to <laughs> a bunch of <laughs> virtual names on the screen. So I hope you're doing well. I can't see you nodding or not nodding or sleeping or whatever it is that you're doing behind. I hope you're doing well. Did you see the email from the university about uh, the timeline for fall? Did anybody pay attention to the University announcement by the president. I, I just got the email. Yeah. Actually. Well, so what it actually says in there is right now there will be um, uh, the steps taken to assess what to do in fall. And basically by the end of June, we will know whether fall is on campus or going on virtually. 
So that's something to, uh, that knowledge is something to look forward to. I do hope that we find a way to do classes in person, but that's something of a developing situation. I don't think anybody is confused about that. What university in the meantime is doing is that they're basically establishing a, a task force that will evaluate uh, possibility if we need to keep social distancing in place uh, and all those details. Uh, how do we go and practically do that given that university is a large one and a lot of classes there are some classes that are only that have hundreds of students. So, in practice, implementing the the social distancing is not necessarily trivial. Uh, so all of that has to be taken into account. Um, so they they expect that by the end of uh, June they will actually have a good idea of what's going to happen in fall. Second part of it, the, the message was that once the um, registration opens for a uh, fall semester, please do go and register early so that university has the numbers they need uh, to assess those same things. So basically continuing student enrollment um, determines the size of the classes and so forth, certainly the starting size of the classes. So they have actually clear numbers to work with. So please actually pay attention to this and uh, April 27th, which is next Monday is the start of the registration. So do register for uh, fall courses as uh, you, just to basically enable the university to plan. Okay. All righty. Uh, did anybody complete uh, the exercise that we started working on? Well, wrong lecture. Uh, started working on. Um, last time with the math lab that was i'm sure have you did it <laughs> <laughs> so so danny are you volunteering javier to show us the result <laughs> <laughs> yes i am confident he has the right results <laughs> we actually we actually had a meeting yesterday through zoom with danny and we were um he was actually showing me how to use MATLAB and not I'm, very, oh, so, I'm not an expert on MATLAB. So now you're a MATLAB expert. So let me actually, uh, does everybody, am I? So if anybody needs a, a short course on MATLAB, I hear Danny is, I volunteer Danny <laughs> to teach you how to use it. Definitely an expert, yes. <laughs> there we go. Uh, part of it is expertise has to be maintained. Uh, I have personally, gone from so i've never actually really dealt with matlab in graduate school at all and then back in the day when i joined postdoc here at ut that was in 2005 everybody uh, <laughs> back in 2005 i joined for postdoc with dr bryant and a whole lot of things um were in matlab and actually my what i did as an initial exercise is construct the code which is actually this network uh, uh, exercise. The one that you're uh, using is Steve Brand's code in MATLAB, but some of those like plot sphere, plot surfaces, and those uh, plot slice and some of the visualization features are mine. And I actually went through uh, designing my own network little simulator. The difference between Dr. Bryant's that you're looking at and mine uh, was that I just used the results of the Fini packing and they were not periodic. So the results that are um, in this, shared in this course uh, are periodic pa packing, which actually removes some of the boundary, uh, boundary issues and finite volume issues. Uh, so in any event, I started using MATLAB uh, and then I went on to teach my undergraduate course in MATLAB for years until switching recently to Python. Um, so the point, of what I'm saying is you have to kind of get used to switching programming tools. They will switch no matter what. Um, sometimes you just have to use somebody's. Um, so it's kind of a norm to actually go and adapt yourself. One thing that I can also uh, tell you is that you forget. So be, <laughs> be sure to keep your feet wet 
in whatever programming environments you want to maintain, everything kind of requires exercise. So let me just quickly visualize, and you are free to change this um, as you uh, um, as you please. Am I sharing? Does everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So uh, where's my Matlab? So basically, uh, there's just a couple of visualization uh, routines that are shared with you here. But if I have this packing, I have all of the information X, Y, Z, uh, and radii of spheres. And the calculations are relatively simple. If I tasked you with visualization, you'd be able to probably sit down in an, after in an afternoon and figure out and rewrite all of these yourself. So there is, uh, when I say, we, and run a view modified packing. There's a number of uh, figures that opens. So this is basically viewing this periodicity, how two neighboring uh, cells basically continue. And any sphere that is counting the boundary is basically restarting or continued on the opposite boundary. So that's something to know about these packings. This is one slice. Uh, through this packing uh, of spheres. And then, um, so this is just a two-dimensional, and then what else? And the light, so basically there's a choice of colors that you can actually probably see for yourself in this plot sphere. So if you don't like some of these um, uh, things, you can change them. You can actually see that I have uh, been experimenting myself with what works. Some of these also over time, they kind of start bombing. You will notice that this code is <clears throat> a nice age of about 13. Um, so some of these, um, the way the MATLAB does the lighting or maybe the, some of them have possibly changed and some of them possibly don't work if you uncomment them. But feel free to, um, change whatever you'd like here to actually just adjust the uh, adjust simulation. Uh, and then there's this run example network that you can basically collect information for uh, different packings. So I asked you to run this. So does anybody want to share the results? Javier, are you indeed willing to share what to do? I will let the master do it, so he can <laughs> show us. Oh, darling, back, back at you. <laughs> Good one, All right, yeah. so let me, let me actually stop sharing mine, and then I have to allow you. All right, so if you want to share your screen, mm. you should be able to. Okay. Is it working? Yes, it is. Nice background. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, basically, this was the original code that yes. you had. Um, so basically, the point of the exercise was to like plot the like these things: permeability yes. versus yes. radius porosity for all of these different files. So one simple way to do it was basically copy paste the code and then just change the. I was the hoping for values. a for loop, but sure. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, it's not the most efficient way, but there's only five points. So it works. Fine. Whatever works. Um, Quick and dirty works. <laughs> yeah. So basically using the uh, functions. Um, okay. So did you preparing the network? Where is it? So this is basically a function that takes the coordinates of the spheres, mm -hmm. the radius of each one, and then basically the unit volume that we defined. In this mm -hmm. case, it was 70s. Uh, then basically divide the data into like the first column is this coordinate, the second is that, blah, 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 mm -hmm. based on the input. Uh, run this function. And then for the network flow calculations, again, it's a function that takes the inputs and outputs of the previous one and basically gives us three values kind of. Q is the flow rate, mm -hmm. P is the node potentials, which I assume here might be like pressures or something, mm -hmm. and perm would be the permeability, uh, with the knowledge that this is not, like it has to be normalized with R squared. So this is not kind of the mm -hmm. permeability we're talking about. So basically, and eventually to find the uh, porosity estimate as well, it's a function that takes 
all the stuff, the number of points, it basically throws the points on the image. It calculates the fraction of points that are inside the spheres based on the coordinates. That's how the function works. Um, so yeah, you basically run this code for all the different uh, like input files. And I basically name each one of them so I can eventually have a kind of a vector of all of the values. So mm -hmm. if I just run this, I would have all of the values, each one of them in its own vector. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted to plot everything, right? So basically, mm -hmm. The blue line in this case is the like the result of our simulation. Mm -hmm. So these values. Um, the model that was that it was supposed to fit is this one, which is the two point seven ten to the minus mm -hmm. three r squared. But like as I guess we'll see in the following slides, it underestimates it. So the actual fit is zero point zero zero five. And um, so this is the permeability versus the grain radius, mm -hmm. and then versus porosity, and then we normalize it, and then versus porosity. So this is you know k versus phi, and then normalized k versus phi. Again, as we'll see in the following slides, there isn't any direct kind of correlation between, in this case at least, between like the normalized permeability and the porosities. Um, I assume we will discuss why that is, but mm -hmm. this is basically the like this is expected, right? The grain radius is gonna be kind of related to the permeability to whatever fit we want. So this is a standard process, right? Uh, when developing a model, okay? So in this case, we actually already know quite a bit about granular materials. We also have a whole lot of models for them. If I didn't, um, if I didn't give you this, as a network model, question is, well, um, what formula do you have available for, for permeability of sphere packings? So if all of you have done petrophysics, advanced petrophysics in some shape or form. What is the formula that we have? The most common formula for permeability of sphere packing where sphere packing has one. Carmen Cosini? Carmen Cosini is one of them. So Carmen Cosini has that function of, it basically says that permeability is some function of porosity. And if I recall correctly, that is phi cube over one minus phi square, something like that, okay? Uh, so whatever it is, it's a, a function of porosity. And then we, do, so that is possibly a slightly complex function. And then what is the dependence on the grain radius? It's a squared. R squared, which is what the reason why we are normalizing permeability here, dividing by R squared. So basically one thing that we got correct, okay, is uh, almost this trend that there is a trend when you do uh, permeability versus grain radius on log scale, right? Uh, you do get close to a straight line. So there is a trend, it's just the trend is off. So we have gotten something correct, but not everything. Welcome to modeling of any kind, right? So we have in this process of assuming um, uh, permeability or uh, developing permeability of a sphere packing, we have done a number of simplifications. And one thing that, is, uh, that we did is we took, so this, this network model said, okay, let me actually, can I now, uh, I'm gonna go back to share screens so that I can just refer to slide. So in the model, in, in the process of building network, okay, I have taken, I have replaced my porous medium which a bunch, with a bunch of interconnected tubes. Okay. So in that process, 
my each my throat my constriction that is um, guiding the flow is given actually here as uh as it's it's a side of a tetrahedron and as a radius of the tube what i did is i replaced every I'm sure this is the part where I could draw. Insert. And I probably have that drawing, but also part of drawing as I uh, go is just also explaining as I go. So as part of the drawing, so this is, let's say, okay. Okay, so if I have three closed spheres, my this is my 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 throat is basically this shape. Okay, let's say that it, it's something like this. Well, what we've done in this process is we've inscribed a sphere here. So there is an inscribed ra radius. So st instead of assuming this complex shape in terms of finding what the uh, flux is through this tube, I have actually replaced this with basically a tube that has this in inscribed radius. And now my formula for flux is corresponding to this tube. Okay. And this tube is actually saying, well, my boundaries are actually way closer than they are in reality. Okay. So there's definite underestimation right there for every single throat that I have in the medium. Okay. And then I consistently go through the entire network and it's underestimated con consistently. So some of underestimation is actually before of this. What is the true radius? Well, true radius is somewhere here, right? Some sort of equivalent radius. Right? Now, sometimes one is, so this is an inscribed radius. So this is sort of the smallest you can fit. And this is a very common way to uh, create uh, network models from, uh, from uh, any kind of media, image analysis as well, because your Euclidean distance, you find the largest Euclidean distance in this throat, and that's essentially your inscribed radius. So it's something that is the simplest thing to actually evaluate from any type of analysis, whether it's this Delaunay tessellation, uh, where I have a, it's easy formula to actually find a sphere that is inscribed given the uh, in between the other three that is touching all other three. So in that sense, it's a simple calculation, but that doesn't make it necessarily uh, 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 one that is correct. The second problem is that, uh, so I could actually go and say, so my area of the throat, one way to estimate this effective is to go use effective air, uh, radius. And that's basically assuming that your area for the throat is R square effective times B. So that's typically called effective radius. So that's definitely going to be ever so slightly larger radius. And then one can, there is actually a space there for a little bit of a fitting exercise, right? So your answer is somewhere in between RI and R effective. Sometimes people take Ri plus R effective over two as a good estimate, okay? And that's actually available. Uh, so you can play with that and do that part. So part of it again is, so the simplifications that we are doing in these networks uh, are that we are basically fitting a tube to things that are actually not, so, uh, tube with a cylindrical cross section to things that are not cylindrical. Second part that we are throwing away is this converging and then diverging geometry. That is essentially that is that I can see here in every pore. So I am first converging to get to the throat and then diverging. 
And what we are doing is we're just placing a tube that replaces a straight tube that replaces this type of a throat. Um, so in that process, we are also throwing away some of the real tortuosity of the medium. Okay, so that is part of that. Those are called typically inertial effects uh, that are happening near the boundaries, and they are simplified in this in this uh, medium. That said. So, so the main question of the model, uh, when the model is created, in this case from a sphere pack, but it could equally be applied to images as well, is that in the process of creating a model, you have simplified things. And you have simplified things. Here, the main simplification is that of geometry. So how then, how representative is your model of your true medium is the question. So when you uh, simplified geometry, one thing that we kept is the connectivity, who is connected to whom, but there are certain parts of the geometry, both in terms of the how complex is the cross section that are changed, and that obviously affects flux and ultimate flux, and also what are the lengths and that affects pressure gradient or ultimate pressure gradient. So if you didn't get the length between the two throats correctly, uh, question is what the errors are. So those are the sources of error. So every time you develop a model, it's natural to have errors. You have basically simplified something, therefore you cut something off. Question is how much did you cut off? And do you understand where things are going? And can you find a way to adjust? And this is why a lot of models have sort of fitting parameters that allow you to kind of correct your formulas, compare them to the reality and introduce a correction. It still allows uh, the good, um, it still allows for this, these are the type of um, explorations that are simply not available with experiments and certainly not easily. So this turning off terms, adjusting them quickly, uh, mimicking, in this case, we will actually also look at the simulation. So mimicking some of these um, phenomena, you can do much more easily virtually than you can do in the lab. And that's the benefit of modeling. And if your model ultimately captures, even after all of the adjustments that you go, you always have to compare with experiment. So when your model captures certain key points, then you basically understand what's going on and have some way to describe your relationships, uh, which is powerful. Okay. So again, we have definitely captured that there is K over R square <laughs> is, is, um, is uh, predictive. Now, the second part of, uh, of the problem, so there is certain part that, is there because we have simplified the description. So how simplified is it? And what are the errors that we're making? Another question that we also have to ask is, are we representative? Uh, is everybody familiar with the representative elementary volume? Yes, no? Yes. So this is again petrophysical concepts. I have subsampled my medium. Is it truly depicting or enough to describe how different phenomena develop in a porous material? So 100 spheres, 200 spheres. Initially, we actually had two, 20 spheres. 20, 100, 200, 500,000. I can actually, one thing that you can um, definitely explore is porosity. And the range of porosities you got for this sphere packing, and this is actually a periodic sphere, sphere packing, is somewhere between 33 and 37%. Am I correct? That's what I think I remember from your plots. Yes? Danny, you show the porosity range. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So what would you expect? What should this is a subset of the same sphere packing? If I am really truly representative for all of those subsets, I should get close to a same value, correct? 
that sort, yes. But I don't. <laughs> okay, so that's part mm -hmm. of the subsampling. So 100 spheres is likely not representative. Okay. Now, or not fully representative. So this is where possibly we simply need to uh, run this on a lot of references. This is also a sphere packing. So there are errors in packing of spheres. This is uh, done using an algorithm. Okay. And that algorithm can have some slight associated errors. There's also a porosity estimate, uh, which is a function that is essentially a Monte Carlo type of evaluation of porosity. I'm throwing dots into the volume and see whether they fell into a sphere or not. Okay. Did I throw in enough dots? So there's uh, every step, there's a uh, possible numerical issues, but I, the key problem here is nevertheless actually representation and whether the subset of the number of spheres that you took is actually representative. So we are looking at trends at the same time. Uh, this is subset of the same packing. So all of the values should, uh, uh, should point to the same type of, it's not the best way to look at the porosity um, porosity uh, and permeability relationship because technically porosity should be uh, very similar here in all of the spots okay so there are certain limitations of of the sample size here as well uh so so in general um any re any what's called empirical re correlations be between por porosity, uh, permeability and anything else, typically look at permeability and porosity and permeability in the green size, depends on the samples we took. Do we have enough samples? So every empirical correlation, the way it's developed, whether we do in the modeling or experiment, it's basically a story on its own for the subset that uh, we look at. So it's, 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 one has to understand that, that those are the uh, limitations and the more realizations we have, uh, the better. Okay. So, uh, oh, this is, I actually drew this already. So essentially there's a problem of uh, replacing. So especially I, I, I drew a case where these three spheres were close. They are not always close. So sometimes I have, um, uh, network that looks like this so these are slightly more open nevertheless it's this throat which this here it's not even closed i'm actually replacing with a tube of this radius so those are all uh, limitations of the simplifications of this geometry but again it's that simplification that enables better simulation okay. um, so just a note that this code is from Steve Bryant, uh, cite his papers if you actually modify and use it. And um, Fini packing of spheres is actually available on Digital Rocks portal. So you can also use the Fini packing that is experimental. The, uh, the sphere packings that I gave you are from uh, an algorithm, which is periodic. So that's another source of data if you need. Now, second thing that one can actually look at is what happens. So now that I have this idealized model, there's certain powerful things that I can modify it. I can play nature a little, if you will. And in that sense, I can explore these relationships further knowing that they are limited. I can still uh, basically uh, look into them further. So, so, so what happens if I have a uh, cementation? So if I actually had uniform cement growing on all of the spheres, so here's an example with 10% uh, more, then in that case, I will actually have some of the throats start to close. So they're smaller and they start to close. So I can actually play directly with radii and start closing them, right? uh, with the understanding that some of them would actually completely disappear. Okay, so you can, uh, take a look at, so some, as they disappear, they will actually cut off connections, and that's a very real thing. So behind me is actually a, a good uh, example. So I actually have uh, cementations. This example, though, is I cannot, I don't have the light 
that allows me to actually quantify cements. But I can definitely provide you with papers where you can actually quantify the amount of, so cementation happens over millions of years often. So one can actually see the stages of cementation and one can quantify how much of cement there is on the grains. So that is one way to actually um, introduce that information. If you have a friend, a geology friend that is um, uh, good with uh, quantifying cements from, which often is a version of point counting from, uh, from thin section imaging, um, then basically you can add cement. And in this model, you're adding cement uniformly. You can also modify it in certain ways to add it to only certain spheres and not the others, randomize it in certain cases. And then you can study what happens to permeability as um, you increase cementation. So this is one basic example, which is relatively simple numerical exercise. So you can actually see the shifts in pore body sizes, right? Um, and then you also the all the other things that you can measure from these sphere packing, so length of the sphere. So you can actually this. So this is the exercise that you're going to, in addition to the one that I mentioned last time. This is going to be your uh, homework. So you're going to take this sample of thousand spheres. And there's basically this exercise is walking you through adding this cement uh, and cement thickness. So here's simply multiplying radius by a certain factor and then um, analyze what is happening uh, to the same permeability plot versus porosity. Now this trend will be a little more real because you're working with one packing and you're truly changing porosity as opposed to just subsampling the same uh, sphere packing, in which case your porosity should be um, technically the same. So this would be the proper way to actually look at what is happening to a, a permeability versus porosity. Okay? And again, you're going to normalize all permeabilities. Okay? And there's also Fontaine Blue sandstone data in there that you can compare with. One more thing that is uh, uh, not, uh, so this is this uh, effective uh, radius. Uh, so this is the suggestion to use a modification of radii. There's also another thing is this unrealistic throat length that is often counted to times and this distance that you're normalizing um, your pressure gradient by uh, uh, pressure difference to get the pressure gradient can of course affect the fluxes directly. So that's something to, um, uh, to uh, account for. And ultimately there is an AAPG paper on the topic where basically they were able to get the model prediction in line with uh, data, Fontainebleau sandstone data from Borby and Zinstein. Does it, is everybody familiar with Fontaine Blue Sandstone? It's a, uh huh, yes. So Fontaine Blue Sandstone is, comes from Fontaine Blue region in France. And at some point it was really easy to obtain Fontaine Blue Sandstone in pretty much nearly any porosity. So you just say, give me a block with 10% or 20%. And also it is very clean. So it is pretty much nearly 100% quartz. Um, and that makes it for a very good model uh, for a lot of things. It's not as easy to get it anymore, which now actually if you go on um, Digital Rocks Portal is actually a pretty good example of that. You will see a whole lot of Benheimer um, much more in Berea uh, compared to Fontainebleau. So Berea and Benheimer do have more clays and are not as clean as Fontainebleau. Uh, but in literature is dominated essentially by good tested sandstones would be Fontainebleau, Benheimer and Berea. Okay. So again, what have we learned here is that the simple models of rock forming processes um, and well, 
you will, will have learned that after you also complete exercise three for homework. But basically you can do testable prediction of trends. And trends is what you can hope for. There's always, always certain things that you're throwing away in your model. So it's extremely hard to get exact match. Uh, but what's good is that you can play with, if you have a good model, you can uh, relate uh, the, the description of the rock to uh, certain properties that are important in engineering. And you can uh, develop trends using a modeling framework, which can be often uh, faster than in the lab. You don't have to have necessarily the sample. And even when you're making mistakes, you're kind of in complete control. So you know everything that uh, is going on in there. So you do have to compare to experiments to see where the shortcomings are. But after that, you can basically at least look at the trends. So this is sort of a grain-based approach uh, for figuring out how the pore spaces, uh, the geometry of the pore spaces as well as the connectivity of it um, affects fluid properties. Right? So, uh, and then the limitations are that you don't always, um, sphere packings are good, up, good of a model up to a certain point, even if you cement them. Uh, there are issues in, uh, good ex network extraction if I actually have uh, spheres that are various sizes, so here's an example, and also are um, not as closely packed. So here, basically this is the inscribed, the black is the inscribed sphere into this throat. Well, this technically really needs to be merged with the neighboring throat, uh, otherwise I'm going to run into a uh, not so good representation of the pore space. So that's all great for the, the green type of granular type of media as well as sandstones but there are rocks that are not dominated by the green structure uh, and a lot of carbonates fall into that category which is where our digital topology uh, will actually be more useful in those methods um, to extract the network you need um, you need a watershed type of method. Regardless, the mechanics of the pore network model that is formed after you get the pore network model from uh, either image or a model, the mechanics of the pore network itself remain the same. Uh, so you need some sort of expression for a flux through the individual tube. And then you are uh, combining them into a network of tubes and flowing through and balancing uh, the fluxes at every node. And it's from that balance that you're going to get uh, expressions for, uh, you're going to solve for pressures at each uh, pore. And those pressures will then allow you to calculate flux, individual flux, fluxes through throats or the connections in the network. And ultimately, uh, flux through the entire network and then you compare to uh, the compare to the Darcy's law in order to grab per permeability from it. Uh, this is not the only type of again this is I, I'm explaining it using flow but a, a lot of similar principles uh, apply for different types of transport so this can definitely be modified for all kinds of transport. Okay. Any questions? before we wrap up and move on. Okay. So again, I will assign today, there will be the network exercise as well as this exercise three from these slides. That's gonna be your next homework. All right, we're gonna now briefly touch um, lecture on surfaces before we actually continue. So at this point, I'm calling these rather advanced topics. Image analysis part in terms of just analyzing images will finish with the surfaces that we're gonna comment on today. Um, after that, there's this forms of simulations using images, uh, which is an area that can be expanded in a lot of ways. One thing that we are definitely limited by is the 
ability to simulate in 3D in class uh, because that is very intense. So we're going to typically in the next couple of lectures, we're going to stick to two dimensional exercises as far as uh, exercises in class go. And that's again, simply because these are uh, very complex. Okay. Uh, I don't need my flag, so I'm going to go here. All right, so now we are going to mention uh, something about quantification and visualization of surfaces using these digitized models and images. So our Common objective in this course is uh, figure out how to perform measurements based on images. And that first you go through the ba basic analysis that you always do is some form of uh, segmentation, typically. And then that is basis for any further simulation. So, uh, so there could be more image analysis in the process uh, to basically digest the model that you need. Um, or you could simply report numbers from images as they are. The common one that we have already encountered is porosity, that's the simplest one, or saturation, that's the second simplest one. Um, so basic quantification then comes down to counting of pixels and voxels. Now, I could also go and identify objects in my image, not just one phase, but multiple. Uh, such as connected components or greens or various topological identifiers. And basically I could do uh, quantification of those objects as well. And that's what we've done in this previous lecture. I could look at also correlations. We have basically skipped uh, two point correlation functions and so forth based on the images as sort of a topic just in, in, in uh, light of having time. And what we're going to basically focus on now as one of the steps in quantification is surfaces, uh, both visualization of the surfaces, but also quantifications of areas and curvatures. Now this is, this has been implicitly done in some of the visualizations already. When I plot the, the spheres in MATLAB, I have plotted their surface. So you have all already inherently uh, seen it and you've seen it in multiple other aspects. Visualization is pretty much everywhere. Is anybody playing video games by any chance? It's okay to say if you, if you are. Well, not right now, obviously. Well, sure. Uh, <laughs> right now, since you, since you started graduate school, you completely stopped, right? Anyway, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> a lot of times, um, surface visualization or visualization in general, you're essentially, if you're a gamer, you're inherently uh, uh, expert in visualization. And you can definitely notice when it's not good, right? So, uh, so there's, that's sort of an industry that pushes the envelope of visualization. I personally don't play games uh, or I'm, I've never been a gamer. Um, it says nothing, but I actually really have appreciation for the <laughs> benefit in scientific visualization that comes from gaming. Okay. Uh, because for one, uh, it's, it's intense uh, seeing a three-dimensional object. We are typically have to digest it as a surface in order to see it, but there's always things that are occluding each other. And when they do, uh, you have to figure out what to visualize. And you have to do that in real time as in a game, typically you're going to have a person uh, moving through, a, uh, through space, right? So it's, it's definitely a non-trivial exercise and it's very, it can be very intense, which is why uh, thanks to gaming, actually pretty good visualization is available on laptops because um, there's a whole industry that is making or market that is making, um, good uh, video cards uh, cheap. So something to appreciate definitely. Now what we're going to look at is just at a very fundamental algorithm of surface visualization as well as quantification of the area because that's something that we actually need from the scientific standpoint. Okay. Now to be 
begin with, you also have to understand what is the scale and resolution of your image. And can you actually go uh, through easy either pixel or voxel counting or surface, uh, uh, surface visualization? So you have to have enough. So this, this is an example of uh, different types of uh, resolutions. Right? You can see the changing diameters. And what do you see? using those resolutions. So basically this entire set here does not have enough resolution to actually see individual interfaces. So when you look at this image versus this image, I can see that certain parts have been drained. And here now I have an interface. Let's see, interface right here. Is everybody seeing my mouse? This is an interface between air and water in a sand. So now I can actually see these individual interfaces and this is the type of image where I would actually uh, quantify such interfaces if I'm interested in interfacial areas between different fluids. We know that the type of displacement um, is actually, uh, it's the interfacial areas keep an important uh, role in quantifying displacement. So there's definite scientific interest in both visualizing and quantifying these areas. Um, if I just have a medical scanner and I'm looking at images that have not been properly resolved, I can actually see that uh, image has been, um, that the drainage has been happening and I can even see there. However, the, the best you can do, this is not the image that you ever segment. You can compare and calibrate uh, a calculation of saturation based on averages that's typically averaged over this entire slice. And that is done, but you do not go into individual pixel counting or the quantification of the surfaces if you don't have enough resolution. Okay? So this is some other examples where you can actually look at all of these um, interfacial areas and how they changed uh, uh, at different types, uh, at different steps of the experiment. And this is where interfacial area calculation could be important, okay? So again, when the resolution is not good enough, then you can work with grayscale value and uh, sort of average them across the slice. That's not uh, the quantification that we are going to look into now. So let's assume that I'm interested in quantifying area. How good is actually just voxel counting? So here's our, uh, 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 info, uh, here's our base image that we already played with a lot of times. And if you're just looking at porosity, so this is where this image is, where the porosity is, or possibly saturation, this would be, um, even if I had multiple, here I have only one phase, but if I had multiple, this is, would be the type of image where it would be okay simply to segment and then count how many voxels are in which phase and calculate saturations based on that. Assuming that I have, and this is back to representative, assuming that I have enough of an image in there and uh, enough of a, of a sample in there, it is perfectly okay to count voxels and estimate porosity and saturation. I have already commented that even for porosity in itself, just as a number, even if your segmentation is not all that good, you're still going to be okay. Uh, you're going to recover uh, porosity value uh, uh, in, in an okay way uh, because the porosity is not so sensitive to the quality of a segmentation. It often averages errors. However, if you want to use that image for anything else, uh, then it, you're going to run into trouble. So how, if I actually really wanted to look at the interfacial areas, however, so this is my pore space, this is my solid space, you can see how near the boundary, that's precisely where I would actually place an interface, I might run into trouble. And this is part of that point spread function problem so when I have extra image near the boundary, boundaries are not as sharp as I'd like them to be. So if I were to draw an interface here, okay, 
question is also then in surface. So this is, I know this is a sphere, right? Now, if I was just drawing things around pixels, assuming that I actually segmented and that algorithm figured out where is my solid, where is my pore space for me, and let's say that I trust that it's as good as I can, you will see that the, you, you then see that regardless this interfaces between uh, as you're uh, as you're tracing the interface between uh, uh, solid voxels and pore voxels, you will see these step-like features along the way. Okay, and it, then to count the area, or in this case, perimeter of this two-dimensional portion of the image, I would basically just have to go and look at the sides of these boxes. Is everybody following? Yes. So if I actually did that, question is, what is the type of error that I would make? Okay. So uh, in two dimension, that would be the length. In three dimensions, it would be an area just counting by the uh, voxel sides. So if I have multiple phases, same question remains. There's a little more complication in there, but I would still have to figure out, well, where is my triple contact and how do I resolve uh, splitting these areas into, for instance, okay? The, so for, again, to get the porosity or saturation, simple counting of voxels after doing the simulation, uh, after doing segmentation is just fine. For areas, let's look at the, uh, the pixel counting for surfaces. So this is a very simple exercise where I took, now I'm assuming this is my, I don't know, oil blob or grain. Let's say that it's a grain. So in this case, grain is aligned with my grid. And if I were, this is a simple angular, angular grain. I don't know where these grains grow actually. Well, let's say that it's a beautiful crystal and it has all of these flat sides. So this is exact thing. If I were to count, count these sides and just get the area, I would be precise, I would be exact. However, we are not always aligned with the grid. And even if I have my beautiful uh, quartz crystal or something that it has this beautiful side, well, quartz doesn't have this footprint, but some simple cubic, this is salt crystal, here we go, okay? So I have salt grain and I, move it slightly so it's not oriented with the, grid, uh, with the grid. I am now going to now start having issues in counting just pixels. So first, if I were to segment this, then this entire little portion here, as I zoom in, is probably gonna be just counted as um, surrounding uh, air phase, and then this is solid. So there will be definite errors in this uh, interface between, will be uh, step-like. Okay. Now, every time I'm counting these uh, interfaces, right, I will always have, instead of sort of a straight line through, I will go, I'm, I'm going to have a step like this. So can we see what that does to the estimate of this length? In this particular case, this would be square root of two if this is one and one. So it's basically square root of two versus two in the measurement, right? And there is no other way than to essentially be under 90 degrees when I'm looking at just pixel, and, uh, pixel size. Okay? So you're gonna always do that type of mistake. Now, if you increase resolution, are you gonna be any better? So let's say that I increase resolution, so instead of this one pixel, I actually have two by two pixels. So now my estimate of the area is this again. Have I improved with resolution? Let me reformulate my question. This is my true line but I'm gonna 
count it as this versus this with the larger uh, with the larger pixel and with the smaller pixel improved resolution i'm going to now estimate this as my area is the area estimate actually or in this case length estimate any different Bernie, are you awake? Yeah, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of this length, which is square root of two, with an increased resolution, I'm going to basically count sides, which is this versus that. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's two versus square root of two, which is the real one. Now I improve my resolution. And then I'm going to just do this. What's the length of this choppy line? Uh, it's also two. Two again. And that's because I have to constantly have 90 degrees, right? right. So that simply doesn't change anything. Improving resolution actually doesn't, at some point, I have uh, improved as much as I can, and that's it. Okay. Back in 2002, I have found that out, like I basically digitized the sphere and I went, and I, I cannot tell you the extent of how upset I was at that fact that by improving resolution, you cannot really estimate at some point you're going to make about 10% of error and you cannot improve beyond that. Okay? And that's the fact that like you always have to stay at 90 degrees uh, for these surfaces and you're not changing much. Okay? So even when I have uh, cases like this where I'm replacing something um, uh, that it has. So this was just an example with the 45 degrees angle. It could be something more general. I'm still going to run into same same trouble that this interface that is kind of smooth like here. I'm going to, if I do pixel length or pixel side length, uh, it's going to be at 90 degrees and I'm going to uh, overestimate. Now in three dimensions, what we actually do, okay, we do actually draw this straight line and we ask, estimate, we, we improve the representation of this as a triangulated surface. So you're seeing actually a three dimensional triangulated surface, a blob sitting in the pore space, and these are your spheres. And this is the algorithm that is underlining most of the uh, visualization, 3D visualization that you see as well. So this is a, a little larger subset of this um, same problem. So we're gonna actually learn how do we improve this pixel counting. So do not do pixel side counting or voxel side counting in order to estimate surface area. Okay. Um, this is basically uh, voxel counted. And uh, so you need to triangulate areas. And even with triangulating areas, uh, you can, uh, improve, but basically this is a digital area by voxel counting versus analytical. Triangulated surfaces get a, a much better result. So this is a relatively old. So in 2001 and 2002, basically when I was a student, there was a number of papers that actually started pointing this out. Okay, so we need to generate uh, surf, or started pointing it out for the porous media applications. Now, what is, uh, so we need to generate surfaces and these surfaces are often called ISO surfaces. So what is an ISO surface? It typically represents points of a constant value within some volume. So we start with a digitized version of a field. For instance, I could have my tomographic image. There are certain grayscale values in there. That's essentially field in 2D or 3D with certain values. And what we often, um, what we often plot is a surface that connects all of the points that have a constant value within that field. Now, if I was segmenting my image and I had zeros and ones, then basically the surface in between zeros and ones uh, could be 0.5. So if I visualize where all of uh, where my um, image formally hits 0.5, I will basically visualize the interface between my phase zero and phase one. 
And this is what we're plotting in 3D specifically. In 2D, that same um, line that is separating two, uh, so zero and one, would be also 0.5, and that's called contour. So contour in 2D and isosurface in 3D. So we, that's how we draw a boundary between two materials is that we typically go to the segmented, uh, segmented image and find the value in between two, um, two labels. Okay? Um, that gives me sort of a threshold grayscale value. Okay? So again, in segmented images, if I had zeros and ones, 0.5 separates. Now, so does 0.2 and 0.8. It's so sort of a matter of choice to place it halfway in between. If you had zero and 255, which is very common for image J, then 127 will do. It's halfway in between, but you can do any other value in between zero and 255 and you will still get isosurface that is close to this, uh, boundary, of, uh, this boundary of separation between two, uh, two, two values. In scientific visualization in general, isosurfaces could be uh, constant values of uh, pressure. So those are the contours that we often plot. Contours of constant pressure, constant temperature, constant density, whatever the field physically means, looking at in 2D contours of constant field value or in 3D surfaces of constant field value is the most common type of visualization of uh, your problem. So this is, again, back to our segmented images. I, I, I could also use, of course, or do a visualization of this field, which is my grayscale values. And let's say I'm gonna now throw some values. Let's say that they're all between zero and 255. These are close to 200. These are close to say 50. So I can pick an isosurface, 50, 200, let's do 100. And that is essentially equivalent to simple thresholding using a threshold of 100 and then plotting precisely that uh, 100 value or where it heads. Okay? So in essence, visualization of these isosurfaces is equivalent to do a quick, simple thresholding and then plotting the surface in between two um, thresholded values. Yeah. Now, surface generation algorithms, no matter what are you visualizing, um, they start from different input. In our uh, 3D imaging, um, there is a 3D field of grayscale values that I possibly need to first segment before visualizing. But either way, so this is for instance, tooth, X-ray of a tooth. Um, so again, you would segment and then do the surface of that tooth. Um, no matter what you do and what it is that you're actually plotting, there's essentially one algorithm underneath, marching cubes algorithm. It started in 1987 by Lawrence and Klein, and that's essentially um, underlining most of the visualization. Now, um, there are changes to that algorithm. Uh, it, it can result in certain topological inconsistencies. The changes really are that to filtering of some sort, which is really just changing the starting image more than the uh, marching cube algorithm itself. So really it's one algorithm at the bottom and everything else is some sort of smoothing or filtering that improves how smooth your ultimate result is. So I'm just gonna briefly explain how this marching alg uh, cubes algorithm works. So it's called marching cubes because essentially it starts from uh, cubes of neighboring voxels. So in 3D, what I'm looking at the edge, uh, at the corners of this cube, this is my voxel center. So the corner of a cube, each corner, I have eight, um, is a center of a voxel. So now that voxel, let's say that I'm in a zero, one image, that voxel can be zero and one, or zero and 255 if I'm in image J. So let's assume that all four of my voxels are inside of phase zero, okay? Then technically, if they're all the same phase, there is no interface anywhere in this little sub-volume. 
So I don't have any interface. My result is no interface. Great. Now, if only one of those voxels is actually uh, phase one and all others are zero, okay, then my interface is somewhere in between. So I can, I can plot a triangle and the triangle separates my phase one voxel from all the others. Does everybody see that? How I can place a triangle. This is a triangle in 3D separating this voxel from all the others. If you don't see it on this image, then we cannot really move on. Do I need to explain again? Gonna take that that's clear. Okay, now what is another possible configuration? I could have two. This is my configuration two. I could have two pixels on any, any neighboring within those eight that are phase one. So those are these outlined uh, voxels. And all others that are phase zero. And then basically this rectangle here, or parallelogram, which is two triangles, separates this shaded two triangles. They separate these two voxels from all the others. Does everybody see that? I can proceed within a set of eight neighboring voxels. This is essentially all of the up to the rotational invari invariance. These are all of the possibilities that I could have. So let's say, take a little something more complicated. So let's say that in this number nine, I have this voxel in the back, this voxel in the back, and this voxel in the back. Their centers are, uh, are uh, and then this one in the front. So those are the centers that are phase one and everybody else is phase zero. Then this shaded slice through the entire um, cube is what separates those two populations. And I, I can draw five, uh, four triangles that do so. They're shaded, the shaded areas. Does everybody see this configuration in 3D? Now I have some choice in how I'm gonna draw these triangles. I could have taken this as a triangle. That's really now up to me. But basically what this algorithm does is it goes through an entire image, a cube. It evaluates all neighboring eight voxels that are creating these cubes. And in each cube, it figures out based on how many pixels, and again, these are my 15 basic configurations up to rotational environments, and just goes through a lookup table of what triangles to set to separate these two phases. Okay. And vertices of these triangles, if I have any side, so let's take this one over here, the front line. So where are the vertices of my triangles? This voxel is solid. This one is void. Therefore, interface has to cut through somewhere in between. So basically my vertex of one of these triangles or multiple of them has to be, here it's plot halfway in between. So based on the values at these pixels, so in this case, if I have 0, 1 and my surface is 0 0.5, I'm going to place this vertex precisely at 0 0.5 between 0 and 1. Otherwise, I slide it closer to here or closer to there, based on what the values are. And that's essentially what this algorithm does. It, it basically has a very fast lookup table and marches through, the, uh, through my uh, image, uh, three-dimensional image in organizing cubes. Okay? So this exercise, I think it will be great for next time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this, uh, the, the sphere that we already have and uh, we're gonna uh, generate sphere surfaces 
and look at them. Okay, so this is going to be exercise for next time. Questions? Yes, one quick question. Uh huh. Um, would it be better on the previous slide, like if the vertex of the triangle that separates, you know, the two phases, if it's like much closer to one than the other rather than halfway? So that depends on the isosurface. So if I am just in a segmented image and I have zeros and ones and my isosurface is 0 0.5, then I'm going to be halfway through. However, that doesn't have to be the case. If I'm actually doing grayscale values, like here, right? Then I have a field of values. They don't have to be just zeros and ones. And in that field of values, if I'm, so let's say again that these are 50s and these are 200s, my interface 100 will be closer to this. And basically that's, I'm gonna slide it closer it's gonna slide based on that value closer to uh, two. So even if I have, if I pick 0 0.2, that 0 0.2 will be then placed closer to this zero than it will 2.1. And that gives you smoothness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I have control over that. Like, yes. And a lot of times this smoothing, so actually if you produce an image from a segmented image, all of these, so if all of these triangles will be at 45 degrees, if they're always through the half, through the half, right? Mm -hmm. And that results in actually a really choppy interface that is not good looking. So what a lot of smoothing kernels do, they actually take my zero one image and they smooth it with like median filtering or something. And then these interfaces kind of slide closer to one side or the other, and that's how you get smoother, uh, smoother. So some of it will happen because of the, um, because of the uh, resolution, your, your eyes won't be able to see, but on certain level, this interface is always looking like this, when you zoom in. And you can smooth it literally by filtering some, your image and creating more real values in between zeros and ones if if zero one is the segmentation does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah it makes sense so basically sliding that vertex creates a smoother appearance mm -hmm. and that's uh pleasing to the eye yep. but you have to be just careful if you're using smoothing kernels and you actually then want to estimate area after it's been smoothed you have to ask yourself whether you trust it. Just because it's prettier doesn't make it more, <laughs> more precise, right? So you're essentially modifying your data. And as long as that modification is not uh, large comparatively to the areas that you're trying to measure, then that's not a problem. Uh, and that's almost a philosophical question in porous media as well. Do I want to then segment at all or should I just plot smooth interfaces without segmenting? However, segmentation is the, assuming you trust your segmentation, segmentation tries to take care of a lot of errors that I have when taking the image and a lot of noise. So I often actually start from segmented images and visualize those because I trust them better. I've, I went through the filtering process already um, as opposed to visualizing from grayscale values. But that's because I've been dealing with a lot of x-ray data in my life and that x-ray data has traditionally been uh, way noisier than I'd like. If you have a very smooth grayscale image, there's no necessarily even need to segment for visualization purposes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But yeah. again, the, the result is smoother if you have real values as opposed to just zeros and ones and placing a 0.5 in between. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thanks. Okay. Well, we will play with these uh, next Monday. Enjoy your weekend. And I'll give you some homework to enjoy too. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's not a large homework. And you will be posting these slides as well, right? Yes.
Yes. Yes. So okay. post all of the slides, post this video, video slides and homework. All right. Okay. All right. And let me know if you have any discussions on your projects. That I'll take those individually. <laughs>